for tuning in today and watching our video archive or live stream, however you're getting it in your living room or wherever you may be around the world. We're so glad that you're watching today. We hope that you're sensing the presence of God. We really desire to minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're believing God to touch you in a very, very special way as you watch this video today. So may God's word touch your heart and we just pray that after you're done watching that you would take time and look through our website and see what all we have to offer. And if you're ever in the Silver Spring area, we invite you to come and be a part of us in our sanctuary and our services. So may God bless you. We want to take you to a service right now. Be blessed. Good to be in the house of the Lord today. A couple of quick housekeeping announcements before we begin. Uh, first of all, as you know, today is Palm Sunday, and apparently if, I know a few people have asked about the actual palm branches. So we do not have them uh, this, this year, but again, it's, uh, uh, but we're, we're, we're all together here. So, <laughs> so just letting you know that. Uh, the other thing is the um, ministry fair. Uh, today is the last day uh, to sign up to get connected to a ministry, so we encourage you at the end of the service uh, to go into the rotunda. Uh, the mission trip to Puerto Rico is also holding a bake sale today, and so we also encourage you to visit their table. And then finally, the Easter Sunday invitation cards. Uh, if you were not here last week, we handed these out, um, and people are taking them and just giving them to friends, neighbors, and coworkers. So Pastor Mike wanted me to mention this morning that if you were not here and you did not get your packet, packet of 10, just to see uh, the ushers at the end of the service. Also, there may be some of you who are totally all out and you may want more. And so if there is enough, please see the ushers at the end of the service. All right. In 1995, I walked on these grounds here for the very first time. I came to uh, this church, and actually this sanctuary wasn't even built yet at the time. I came as a staff member with Camp Sunshine. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Camp Sunshine has a way of um, getting a hold of people. I thought I was going to be here for one summer. Um, Eighteen summers later, I was still here. <laughs> Uh, but I'm so grateful to God for those many years and for the experiences that we had and for the friendships that were made. But this church was part of that journey for me. And I'm so grateful to God for what he's doing in our midst. God has something more for us. Amen. Peggy, I asked the question, how many of you are still around that saw this house in the former in its former glory. He goes on to say the glory of the latter house Amen. will be greater than that of the former. Amen? Amen? And so let's continue to believe that God has great things in store for us. Are you ready for the word of God today? Amen. Amen. Well, let's get to it. The message today is the king is coming. The king is coming. As you know, today is Palm Sunday, historically, biblically, a very important day. Palm Sunday is the beginning of what is called Passion Week. It is the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry. It is the final days leading up to his crucifixion and resurrection. In many ways, we can say it is the beginning of the end of Jesus' ministry here on earth. A couple weeks ago, for those of you who are here on Sunday, uh, Minister Frederick shared a message entitled, Worship the King. Interestingly enough, the events he spoke about relate directly to Palm Sunday. So I was sitting there listening to his message, and I thought, well, God has something to say. <laughs> Amen. So uh, we will revisit some of those passages today, but we will look at it from a different perspective, and we will see what the Lord has for us. So in many ways, this is part two. The king is 
coming. Let's look at Luke chapter 19. We're reading from verse 28. And it says, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell them the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees and crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if you keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is life and light. So Lord, show us your ways. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, into our midst. Transform us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the events we just read took place on Palm Sunday. Jesus was entering Jerusalem on his way to Calvary. It was a very significant event 2,000 years ago, but what does that mean for us today as we enter in to Passion Week? The first thing we need to see this morning is that Jesus was riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Biblical times when a king rode in on a donkey, it symbolized peace. So we begin today by looking at the presence of the king. Everybody say, the presence of the king. As Jesus rode in that day on the donkey, he was making two statements. Number one is that he was king, and number two is that he was coming in peace. In contrast, in biblical times when a king rode in on a horse, it symbolized a time of, of war. So Jesus' choice of a donkey was very significant. As we learned two Sundays ago, he was fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9 that it talks about a king and he would come in riding a donkey. The point of the matter is this. The presence of the king will bring peace. And Jesus is called the prince of peace. And what you and I need to understand today is that peace is not weak. Peace is not weak. Peace is powerful. On this Palm Sunday, God is desire, desiring that we will experience his peace. You remember, I think it was earlier this month, we had about a 24, 48 hour period of a, of a lot of wind. How many of you remember that? It was very, very windy. As a matter of fact, it was so windy uh, that night, I, I couldn't even sleep. And so that's actually when I started to put the notes together for this particular message. But, you know, the Gospels tell a story of Jesus and his disciples, and they were out on the water. Many of you know Jesus said, let's go over to the other side. And Mark 4.37 tells us that there was a strong wind that came, and the waves were so powerful that they came over the edge of the boat so that the boat was nearly swamped. And the disciples were all panicked. But Jesus was in the back of the boat sleeping. Here you have all these winds and the waves, and the, 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 it looks like the ship is about to go down. 
And Jesus is in the back and he's sleeping. And the disciples woke him up and they said, Master, don't you care if we drown? The Bible says that Jesus got up, he rebuked the wind, and he said to the waves, Peace, be still. The wind died down and it was completely calm. If you have peace, you can speak peace. Amen. If you have peace, you can declare peace. The wind died down. It was completely calm. And Jesus said, why are you afraid? Where is your faith? And they asked this question. They said, what manner of man is this? What kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Well, I'm here today to tell you what kind of a man this is. His name is Jesus, and he is the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. And if peace can calm a storm, it means that peace is more powerful than the storm. Amen? Let me say that again. If peace can calm a storm, it means that peace is more powerful than a storm. I don't know what storm you might be walking through today. I don't know what you're facing, but I have a message for you this morning. The king is coming. Hallelujah. The prince of peace is in our midst. And in the authority of Jesus, we can speak peace to every storm today. He rode into Jerusalem in the power of peace. The Bible says it's a peace that passes all understanding. Philippians 4, 7 and it guards our hearts and our minds. And when the world tells us that we should panic, and there's so much going on in our world today, many opportunities to panic and be afraid, but the Prince of Peace steps in to the situation. Hallelujah. And he is desiring the same, that we will walk in his peace. It is in that same week, Passion Week, the same week that he rides into Jerusalem, that he would comfort his disciples with these words. John 14, 27 tells us, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives you. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. The peace that God gives is not the same as what the world gives. When the world gives peace, it still leaves a troubled heart. It still leaves fear. But God's peace delivers us from fear, delivers us from a troubled heart. He was bringing peace into a city that day that was about to be turned upside down. With his arrest, with his suffering, with his crucifixion, and then with his death. But in the midst of all that chaos, they would need his peace. Do you remember a man by the name of Gideon? Judges chapter 6 tells his story. And he was being attacked. Him and his people were being attacked by the Midianites. And one day the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon pretty much said to the Lord, You have the wrong person. Gideon said, I am the least of the least. And through a process of events and Gideon needing all kinds of reassurance, finally God would reveal himself to Gideon as Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. You see, what Gideon needed that day was not courage, even though he seemed to be lacking it. And what he needed that day was not strength even though he also seemed to be lacking in that area. What Gideon needed that day was peace. And the Lord said to Gideon, peace, do not be afraid. You see, when we walk in God's peace, it doesn't mean that all of our questions will be answered. Many of you know that it's probably a good thing that God doesn't answer all of our questions. <laughs> because if he did, we'd never get around to doing what he's asked us to do if we knew fully what was before us. But the reason we always don't do what God is asking us to do is not many times because we don't lack vision. Many of us have all kinds of vision. It's not because we don't lack his 
ability. We know that he has empowered us to do what he's called us to do. The reason why many times we don't get around to doing what God has called us to do is because we don't have peace. But once that peace fills our heart, as it did Gideon, he went on to do great things for God. And I believe that as the peace of God fills our hearts, that we will get busy doing what God has also called us to do. I pray on this Palm Sunday that the God of peace will impart to us his peace. Let's just receive it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The presence of the king brings peace. As Jesus entered the city that day, the people lined the road. They waved palm branches, a symbol of triumph, a symbol of victory. They sang praises to God in a loud voice. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So we looked at the presence of the king. Now let's look at the praise of the king. Everybody say presence. Now say praise. As I was preparing this message, I was thinking back. I said, you know, it's been a long time since I've heard a message on the power of praise and worship. I grew up in a uh, Pentecostal church, and for many years during my childhood, we sang out of the, uh, out of the hymn book. And uh, by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. There are some amazing songs in those hymns. Amen. And when you look at the depth of the things that were written, you could see that their experiences with God were very, very real. But one day I remember they projected a song onto the screen, and it was the first time that I had ever experienced anything like it. And the leader sang a song that day I will never forget. And we're not going to sing it today because I know many of you, once you hear it, will say, oh yeah. <laughs> but that song was, As the Deer Pants for the Water. So my soul longs for you. And after that, we started doing many more songs that were very similar to that. And it opened up a new experience about what it is to truly worship God. And then I remember another significant moment. Uh, a team from Christ for the Nations Institute. I believe it's in Texas. And they came up to Toronto, Canada, where I, was, uh, where I grew up. And they had a night of worship and I remember that that night launched me again into a new level of worship. I went out and I bought, um, I guess we call them cassettes. <laughs> yes, I am that old. <laughs> bought out five or six cassettes. But I remember that I would spend so many hours, countless hours, just listening to those and worshiping and praising God. You see, our God is worthy of praise. <laughs> Amen. And as Jesus entered the city on that day, the people cried out to God in praise. And on this Palm Sunday, we need to be a people of praise. The King of Kings is in our midst this morning. It was customary in biblical times and still is today in some parts of the world that when you walked into the presence of royalty, you were always supposed to bring a gift. Remember the wise men, when they came to Jesus, they were looking for a king. And so with them, they came bearing gifts, so much so that Herod, remember, he was threatened because he heard that a king was being born. And so he had all of the male children, two and under, just killed, fear of a king rising up. So it was customary to bring a gift to a king. When you and I come before the Lord, we also have a gift to bring. The gift we bring is praise. Hallelujah. The gift that we bring is worship. Psalms 100, verses 1 to 5. It says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. 
We are to enter the gates of our Lord with thanksgiving in our hearts and our courts with praise. We used to sing this song years ago. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. Amen. These are kingdom words. His gates, his courts, we're coming before a king. And again, Psalm 95 says, come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Verse 1 to 3. Let us shout to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God and a great king over all the earth. He is a great king and he is worthy of praise. Let's give the Lord praise in this place this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Give him praise. They praised him so much that day that the Pharisees said to Jesus, rebuke them. Rebuke them, Jesus. Tell them to stop. They were acknowledging that Jesus was king. And the Pharisees were concerned that there would be a revolt. But Jesus says in Luke 19, verse 40, I tell you that if they keep quiet, the very stones will cry out. You see, the presence of the king will always result in praise to the king. I said the presence of the king will always result in praise to the king. The presence of the king will always demand, command a response. If we don't praise him, the very rocks will cry out. That's just powerful stuff. That's just powerful stuff. He said, if you don't praise me, the rocks are going to praise me, but I will get praise. Hallelujah. If we who have breath don't praise him, then some inanimate object will. If someone doesn't praise him, then something will. The presence of a king will always demand a response. Hallelujah. You see, he is king. Whether we praise him or not, he's still king. Hallelujah. I don't know what it is you're facing today, but I've got a message for you. The king is coming. Hallelujah. He is enthroned on the praises of his people. He lives in our praise. One song says, as we worship, build your throne. You see, what does that mean? When we praise, God comes. Hallelujah. When we praise, the king shows up. And when the King of kings and the Lord of lords shows up, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Give him praise in this place today. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he's worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. Second Chronicles chapter 20. You remember this story? It's the story of King Jehoshaphat, one of my favorites. Oh, wow. They received a word that three armies were coming against them. Three armies were coming to attack. The Bible says they set themselves to seek the Lord. But during their time of prayer, a word came that they would not need to fight in this battle. Because the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. Hallelujah. And very unique instructions were given. They were told to send the praisers out before the army. And in obedience, they did just that. And as they declared the goodness of God, the Lord caused armies, the opposing armies, to turn on each other. They didn't even need to fight the battle. The enemy's army destroyed themselves that day. Hallelujah. I was thinking, you know, I would have probably chose a, a, a song with some more stronger words. 
But all they needed to declare was he is good. (laughs) Hallelujah. He is good and his mercy endures forever. I want to encourage you today that we can declare the goodness of God in every situation. Goodness today, no matter what you're facing, he is good. No matter what you're walking through, he is good. Amen. You see, we already know the next Sunday we'll be praising. Hallelujah. As we celebrate his resurrection, we know the next Sunday this place will be filled with praise. But we don't need to wait till next Sunday to rejoice. (laughs) Hallelujah. Glory. We can praise him today because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now lives in us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just begin to praise him. Begin to praise him. Hallelujah. To God. The King is coming. He is here today to heal, to deliver, to set free. Oh, hallelujah. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Everybody say the presence. Now say the praise. Next we'll talk about the purpose. Hallelujah. The purpose of the king. The triumphant entry on this Palm Sunday was the first time that Jesus would allow people to praise him in that way. The first time that they would, he would allow them to praise him as king. His acceptance of the people's praise was significant. It signified that his time had come. You may recall throughout the Gospels, there were times and there were certain occasions where he would say, don't tell anybody about this. And even a couple of times he specifically said, my time has not yet come. But on this Palm Sunday, he would accept the people's praise, signifying his time had come. The purpose that he had come was about to be fulfilled. As I mentioned earlier, Palm Sunday was the beginning of the end of his ministry here on earth. Everything that had taken place since his birth had led up to this moment. And we need to understand this, that there were two groups of people that were lining the streets that day giving him praise. There were those praising him as king, and they were expecting him to overthrow the political leadership of that day. They were getting ready for an earthly king. They were thinking it was going to be a week of political unrest. But you see, the greatest thing that could have been happening for them that day was happening, but they couldn't see it. They couldn't see it. And instead of a kingdom there would be a cross. And the same people that were crying Hosanna would in days to come be crying crucify him. You say, how does this happen? How does our praise turn to protest? And how does our love turn to disappointment? It happens because we do not understand the purpose of the king. We do not understand what he's doing in a particular moment. We think he's doing one thing and he's doing another. They were looking for something temporal, but he was focused on that which is eternal. When we fix our eyes on those things that are temporary, we miss the eternal at work. I'm speaking to those of us today who are questioning what God is doing in a particular area of your life. You say, God, why is this happening? Why am I walking through the things that I'm walking through? I thought you were going to do this, and instead you seem to be doing that. I prayed that you would do this, but instead it seems like you're doing something different. We talked about Gideon a little bit earlier. If you remember when the Lord appeared to him, 
Gideon said, if the Lord is with us, then why have all these things happened? If God is truly with me, then why am I walking through the things that I'm walking through? I've done everything you've told me to do, and yet still, it doesn't seem like things are going well in my life. You see, I don't always understand why at times life can be so difficult. There are no easy answers. I can tell you at times that life does not always go the way we think it will. You see, there are two types of people walking, lining the streets that day. There were the crowds that were shouting praise and hosanna to the king, expecting a political change, but included in that mix was his, were his disciples. Those 12 men that had followed him closely for three years. They had traveled with him. They ate with him. They learned from him. They had seen the many miracles that he had performed firsthand. Jesus was not just their king, but he was their brother. He was their friend. And even though he told them of the events that would transpire, imagine the hurt that they would feel experiencing their Lord, their friend, their brother suffer and die. Fear, disillusionment, disappointment would set in. The common denominator is this, between the people that lined the streets that day and the disciples that walked with him. They did not truly understand the purpose of the king. One group would turn their backs on him. The other group would hide, filled with disappointment. We know Peter would even deny him three times. And today, maybe some of us find ourselves in the similar position. You love God with all your heart, but deep within, there's disappointment. Deep within, there's pain, and you, you cannot seem to fully understand why a God who loves you so much and whom you love would allow you to go through the things that you're going through. I have good news for you today. The king is coming. And his ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. God has not forgotten you. You see, they thought he was working to set up an earthly kingdom. But he was establishing a heavenly kingdom. And what Jesus is doing in your life and mine is going to be more than a temporary fix. Amen. He's about to fix things in a way that they will never be broken again. <laughs> Glory to God. He knows what he is doing. You are not alone. He is with you. Several years back, I was uh, sharing a message in a church in northern Canada. And after the, I think sometime during the message, I touched on the story of the three Hebrew children. You know the story well. Thrown into the fire, three of them. But when they look in, there's a fourth. Amen. One like the Son of Man. And after the message, a man came up to me and he said, I need to testify. He said, because what you're saying is very real to me. And he shared this story. He said that he received a phone call one day that he was to go to the local hospital. He said there had been an explosion. His son and a few of the friends were hurt in the blast. And he went to the hospital. And when he got there, he said, I could smell the burn. I could smell the burn. He said he ran into the room where the doctor was and he said it had been, it was so bad that some of the material from the clothing was burned into the skin. And he, when he left and he walked into the waiting room, he said, Lord, where were you? He was a believer and he just began to cry out to God, Lord, where were you? And he said, sitting there in a chair was one of the young men who was also there. And he said, under his breath, he whispered something. And the man said to him, what did you say? He said, he was there. And the man said, what do you mean he was there? And the boy, the teen boy began to explain to him. He said, just before the blast, he said, we saw a white light. They went back to the scene after. And he said, the place was destroyed. He said, all the windows in that place were blown out. 
And every type of furniture that was in that room that you would think would be in the living room was gone. He said it was all burnt. And he said, I didn't fully understand the meaning of I was there. He said, until I noticed in the corner of the room, there was a, a glass case, corner case. And he said, inside the case was the word of God. And it was open wide. And he said, everything else in that room was destroyed. He said, the only thing that remained was that glass case with the word of God. He said, there's no way those boys should have survived that blast. But he was there. He was there. And I want to encourage you today. I do not almost understand why things happen the way they do. But God is a God of purpose. And in the middle of the heartache, and in the middle of the pain that you are facing, He is with you. He came to fulfill His purpose on the cross so that you and I can fulfill the purpose that He has for us. And even in the midst of all the suffering that will take place during that Passion Week, He kept His eye on the purpose so that you and I, in the middle of anything we're going through, can keep our eyes upon him. Because he fulfilled his purpose, we can fulfill our purpose. Because he fulfilled his destiny, we can fulfill our destiny. He knows what it means to suffer. He is with us today. Let's give him praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Everybody say the presence, the praise, the purpose, and finally today, the passion, the passion of the king. Luke 19, reading for verse 41, it says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, there's that word. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The day will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and circle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another. And here it is, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. As Jesus approached the city, the Bible tells us that he wept over the city. And he begins to talk about a coming destruction. And when we look to the end of that passage, we see the reason why. He says, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Most of us know that verse as you missed your time of visitation. How many of you know that there are certain verses in the Bible that really seem to just sum it up? You know, it's, it's, it's all good, but there's certain verses that really can get to us. And this is one of them. He weeps over the city. And he says, you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. He was right there. He was walking with them. And you could hear the cry of his heart. I was here. I was in your midst. I was with you. And yet you missed it. It is absolutely possible for the king to be right here in our midst and for us to still miss it. It's possible. I know we live in a dispensation of grace. And thank God for it because how many of you know we need that grace? But even in this dispensation of grace, it is still possible for us to miss out on what God is doing. We've been talking about evangelism this month. Jesus looked over the city, weeping over it. Are we weeping over our city? You see, I never want it to be said of me that I missed my time of visitation. I never want it to be said that I missed out on what God is doing, but what about over our city? What about over this region? What about over this nation? Are we missing our time? And are we weeping over the state of affairs that we are going through? Are we touched with the same passion that Jesus was touched with as he looked down over the city that day? 
The songwriter Francis Crosby wrote these words, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. And this should be the cry of our hearts. That as individuals, we don't miss our time. That as a church, living word, we don't miss our time. And as a nation, we don't miss our time. Never let it be said of living word that we did not recognize the time of God's coming to us. We need to have a, such a sensitivity in this hour. It is possible to miss out. And you know, I was thinking too, there's something about the Holy Spirit, you'll notice that you always know when he arrives. You'll always know when he comes, but it's not as always easy to detect when he leaves. It's not always easy to detect when he leaves. The reason is, is because when he comes, you know, we, we, get, we get so busy. And we start doing the things that we've always done, and we keep doing those things. And then we keep doing them, and keep doing them, not realizing that God has moved on. He's doing other things now, but we're still holding on to what he was doing. He's doing something new in our midst. And we cannot miss out on what God is doing. I don't know about you, but I want to be part of what God is doing in this hour. And I want to be part of what God is doing in this region. Luke 24, and we're closing, gives the account of two of his disciples. They're walking on a road toward a village called Emmaus. They were a few miles outside of Jerusalem. And they were discussing all the events that took place. They were probably discussing uh, this whole Passion Week. The, um, the entry and his arrest and his suffering and his crucifixion. And as they're discussing, the Bible tells us in Luke 24, 15, that Jesus himself came and walked along with them, but they did not recognize him. And after some time that he spent with them, it says their eyes were opened and they knew that they had seen the Lord. You say, what is his passion? His passion is that our eyes will be opened. That our eyes will be opened as a church over the reason why we really are a church. That our eyes will be opened as individuals to the purpose that he's called us. That our eyes will be opened over the harvest of souls that he is calling us to reach. That we will not miss our time. A few Years back, prior to going back to Canada, I had the opportunity to serve as the young adults pastor for a couple years. Joyous years. Oh, I heard an amen. And I was thinking for you young adults who are sitting in here today, the Lord gave me a word for you, and I want to share it now. And here's the word. The word is now. The word is now. Now. You say, what does that mean? I don't know what it means to you, but that's the word that the Lord has. The word is now. He's speaking to some of you young adults, and he's saying, now is that time. He's calling you now. It is time for you to step out. It is time for you to step up. It is time for you to take your place. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is the time. Now is the time of his coming. He is in our midst. Do not miss your time. Revelation 7, 9, as we close today. It says, after this I looked. And there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. You say, what is his passion? That's it right there. His passion is that multitudes will be before the throne from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne. And the only one who can sit on a throne is a king. And before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes, and holding palm branches in their hands. 
Everybody say the presence, the praise, the purpose, the passion. Let's give him a hand clap of praise as we stand this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's all stand this morning. Thank you, Jesus. You see, this message will end the same way it began. You see, the king is coming again. The king is coming again. And this time he won't be riding on a donkey. <laughs> Hallelujah. Revelation tells us that he's going to be riding on a white horse, triumphant, victorious. Will we be ready? Will we be prepared? to receive our King. As the altar workers and ministers come this morning, we're going to pray together in a moment. This altar call today is for those who are in need of prayer in any area of your life. If this message has spoken to you in any way, that this altar then is for you. Come and let's seal what the Lord has spoken in our hearts. Please remember also the white basket offering this morning. We want to prepare those new life boxes so that when people come and give their lives to Jesus, we have something that we could give them. And for some of you, young adults in this place today who maybe needed to hear that word now, and maybe you heard it, you don't even know what it means to you. I encourage you to come and let us stand and agree with you today, today in prayer that whatever it is that God has for you will be fulfilled. As we pray together today, if you have never received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, hear me today, the King is coming. And you do not want to be left out. If you don't know today that if you die, you would go to be with the Lord, then this call is for you. Come today and give your heart to the Lord. I'm going to pray a prayer in a moment. I'll ask everybody to repeat after me. But if you've never given your heart to the Lord, as I say these words, pray this prayer. Let's all bow our heads today and let's declare these words. Dear God, I come humbly before you today, realizing I am lost without you. I need you in my life. I ask you to forgive me for every sin I've ever committed. Wash me, cleanse me, come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. I receive you now, Lord Jesus. I confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He died on a cross for my sins. He was buried and he rose again. And he is alive today. He is the Son of God. Thank you for hearing my prayer and forgiving me of my sins. We hope you've enjoyed watching today. We trust that God has ministered to you. We're praying that God will touch you and bless you and strengthen you and that he would have taken the word today that you've listened to and imparted it into your life in a very special way. 
Take time to look at our website and see the other things we have to offer, our upcoming events, other ministries that we're involved in, and also the time of our services. If you're ever in Silver Spring area, we invite you to come to a live service and you will never be the same. Once again, thanks for viewing. May God richly bless you.